Uh, hi everybody, my name is Mateusz. Uh, I'm a lead programmer at Vine Monarch, and I would like to tell you the story of uh, Woodcraft Inc. production. Uh, a few words about me. Uh, I'm working in Vine Monarch for three years already. The last two and a half years I was making the Woodcraft game. Uh, and before I was working on uh, OSER, the instant simulator, uh, the first part of OSER. And before that, I was working in uh, IT. But I decided to change and go into the game dev. Our studio by Monarch, Hard Rock Game Studio, founded, I think, four years ago already. Uh, by Kacper and Grzesiek, who are not here, luckily. Uh, so I can say whatever I want. Nope. Uh, <laughs> I'm not afraid of you, Persky. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, both guys, Grzesiek and Kacper, were working in 11-bit studios before on this war of mine. Uh, games that we made before, Woodcraft, uh, Crusher enemies, the uh, mini RTS, I would say, uh, and two parts of OSER, the instant simulator. Uh, it's a genre of, of itself, really. Uh, this is a game that you construct phrases from the words to insult your opponent. Uh, what's common between those three games that we made before? Uh, they all made in pixel art. By Persky here, yeah, it's him. Uh, but that's not the most important thing. Uh, all of these games were small. Like, I think the the production of Crusher Enemies was the longest one, and it took us one year to finish it, exactly one year. Uh, also, Osir, the first Osir was half year. The second was something similar if I remember right, uh, and also the teams were small. It was like three to four people, maybe Crash Your Enemies, it was five people, maybe, I don't remember well. So that was our exp experience from, from before, yeah? Small games in pixel art uh, with small teams without a producer. And then Witcraft Inc. Uh, the simulator, like business simulator tycoon game about cannabis industry uh, published by Devolver Digital. Uh, as you can see on the screen on, the, on, on your right, it's completely different than uh, the games that we made before. It's in 3D, it's in comic art style, uh, about, about the style Persky and uh, Daro here were speaking before, like yesterday. Uh, okay, last check. Uh, and clearly it's a bigger game. Like the production of Woodcraft Inc. took us two and a half years. Uh, and the team was much bigger. It was, the core team was about 15 people, uh, up to 20 sometimes in the times of needs. Uh, and there was also some outsourced guys, like some engineer writing uh, some QA. Uh, so clearly you can see this is the, the biggest project that we made so far. And when we started, we didn't really know how to make bigger games. Uh, so this is the story of some of problems and mistakes that we make uh, during, during the production. All right, first, we didn't have any producer uh, because the games that we made before, there was, they were made without the producer and they went fine. So we guessed that it would be okay to not to have a producer. Uh, was it a problem? Yes, a little bit. Uh, especially in the beginning, after the, after the pre-production phase, after the prototype, uh, we had 
problems with, with long-term planning and estimating the features, the workload of the features, the number of iterations of the features. Uh, it was really uh, hard for us to, to, to estimate how long it will take. Uh, and there was nobody, like a producer, uh, to think about it. So uh, what did we do? It was uh, Leeds' responsibility uh, to plan and estimate the features. Uh, and it got, in the beginning it wasn't that good, but uh, with time it got better and better. Uh, we, we started to know our game and the complexity of our game better, uh, our teams also. Uh, so the estimations from milestone from to milestone got better and better, but it resulted in leads multitasking over time a little bit, uh, and also like as we had our production duties, we couldn't we couldn't solely focus on on work of our team, on the quality of work of our team. Uh, so this was. Uh, a problem like for example me like I was a lead programmer I couldn't review the code of my team as much as I wanted uh, because I had some other things to do also especially in the beginning we made some unplanned features uh, like for example there was dirty money laundering uh, which was in the prototype but finally uh, we, we cut it out because it, it wasn't working, and luckily we, we cut it out. Uh, and also we made some unnecessary tools in the beginning because like we thought, okay, this will be a, a strategy simulation game, so I think it will be like heavy UI. Like we were sure it will be heavy UI. Uh, so we thought, okay, we have to address the, the nested prefab issue that was uh, uh, in the Unity at the time. Now it's, there are nested prefabs, but at, uh, at the time there, there wasn't. Uh, so we made a, a custom CSS-like tool uh, to address the problem of nested prefabs, but in the end we didn't really use this tool. So it was like loss of time and, and, uh, and work and money, obviously. Uh, so. I think if you would have the producer, uh, he could uh, just like ask us question if this is really necessary, do we have to make this tool, do we have to uh, make this feature, uh, so maybe it would work better, especially in the beginning. Uh, also other solution that we used during the production was the uh, Agile methodology. Uh, so we had our milestones, the milestones were um, divided into sprints. Uh, we have our meetings. It wasn't like classical scrum, uh, but it was a kind of a scrum. We didn't have a stand-ups because nobody was standing really. We called it sit-ups. Uh, and it wasn't daily. It was like every second day. Uh, and, it, and it worked. Like if we stumbled on an unexpected issue, uh, we could address it like quickly. And the next sprint, we could like change the production plan. Uh, so we were quite like agile, like the name says. Uh, so yeah, this it, there had been some issues with this uh, with this agile methodology, but it worked for us with uh, with production of Witpref. Uh, okay, another problem: our game vision. It was clearly overstated. Uh, why? Because like, we wanted our game uh, to be profound. We wanted the game to differ from uh, all the mobile uh, wheat games that are on the market, that are like really, oof, really simple, and where you have to just click and do some other stuff. So we wanted to add more layers to our game, more features, uh, like for example, legislation, uh, legislation, the logistics, smuggling, uh, police, competitions, a lot of systems in that game. Uh, too much in the game vision, at least. Uh, and also uh, the, f uh, the scope of these features were, were too big. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this, this picture on the right is a picture of map a feature that finally didn't make to the final game. Uh, but it was in the prototype. It didn't look like that. Uh, it looked 
much worse than that. Uh, but after the prototype, uh, we realized that uh, we, we, we are not able uh, to make all of these features uh, with that scope, so we just cut them out. Uh, also, you can see there, in every state, we wanted uh, to have at least one playable city, and at the time we didn't realize how much will be the cost of, uh, of production of a city, or like of a 3D scene, and also we didn't realize uh, how the game would be unplayable uh, with too many cities at the same times, at the same time. So finally, we finished with uh, with a scenario with three cities at maximum at one time. Uh, right? Okay. There were some design dead ends in our game, uh, which was a result of the also the the game vision and the. Uh, the the profundity of the game that we wanted to achieve. Uh, so some systems, like some, nearly every system in the beginning were too complex. And we focused too much on, uh, on simulation of the reality instead of fun factor. Uh, luckily, the thing that we changed afterwards. Uh, and also the system as the system were complex, we had some user experience issues of uh, showing the, the features to a player. Yeah? Uh, it was really hard in the beginning. We did some play tests after the prototype. It was really hard for a player to understand what's really happening in the game. Like without an assist of, of one of the developers, he couldn't really uh, play the game. Clearly, it was uh, too complex. Uh, so what did we do? We just simplify everything. And uh, we hire an UX, UX designer, David, who made a heck of a job of uh, putting a readability in our uh, user interface. This is uh, an example of, of a panel from the prototype. And the panel, it's not exactly the same panel, but you, get, you can get the idea. And the panel from, uh, from the final game. Here on the left, uh, you have batches with effects. Every batch has like five positive effects, five negative effects. Every uh, effect has its own magnitude, uh, which was a result of the setting of the cultivation process. Uh, pfft, so you can see it's... it's it's really too complicated. And in the end, uh, we just left with, with strain, just with the FX, without any property. Uh, the FX is there or not. And that's it. And the only um, property of the, of the batch that is dependent on the cultivation process is the quality of, of the final batch. So it's much, uh, it's less complicated than it was before. Uh, and therefore, it was easier for us uh, to show it to the player in, in a readable and understandable way. Uh, after the prototype, we, we decided that we will f uh, focus more on the, on the fun factor than reality simulation, and this is the example. This, this slot machine uh, is our uh, breathing feature. Uh, you can see it's, it's, uh, there's no connection between uh, this, this slot machine and genetic engineering. Yeah, but we decided, okay, we wanted the, this feature to be simple and, and fun. Uh, so you just drag and drop strains. Uh, you just pull the trigger, and that's it. That's the whole feature. It's like you, you see it, and you know how to play. Uh, and it's eye appealing. So it's much better... Uh, solution that we tried to use before. Okay, after the prototype, we realized that our game loop, it's not really there. The systems were there, uh, okay, they were too complicated, but they were there, you could play the game, but there was really no goal uh, for a player to play this game. Maybe just 
I don't know, earning money or something. Uh, so there was no progression system, no progression design at the end of the prototype. So the prototype was really unfinished. Luckily, the evolver accepted it. Uh, so what did we do? Uh, we introduced the scenario-driven gameplay. Uh, so there are quests, there are objectives. So there is a clear goal uh, for the um, for the player to he know what to do, he know what he want to achieve. He want to like play the scenario. And now we have two scenarios in the game. Uh, we also re rework the the mechanics. We wanted to make them simpler and more uh, fitting the the scenario gameplay. Also, our lead designer, Kuba, who is not there, who is not here, uh, made some spreadsheet simulations uh, before uh, before implementing uh, some formulas or some mechanics. Uh, he wanted to check if specific formula will work in every stage of the game, in the in the start game, in the middle game, in the in end game. So at least after the simulation, he knew that some solutions will work and some won't. Uh, so in that way, we've saved some iteration process. Uh, we didn't implement too much. All right. OK, a few words about game architecture. Uh, this is uh, a general role, role that was given to me by my technical boss, Grzegorz Mazur. And more or less, it's, it's true. Uh, we did cover the, the game with shit in the end phase of the production. I'm not really proud of the, uh, of the quality of the code that like, was in the game in the end, because there was just too much work to do, uh, too much bugs to fix. And no, no, the gameplay was great. Uh, but the architecture of the game was solid enough. Like, the game didn't fall over. It works. So I think it's true what he said. OK, this is really a simplified uh, diagram of the architecture of the game. On the, on the bottom, we have data. Uh, the data which was presented by designers uh, in spreadsheets and scriptable objects, and they were binded together. In scriptable objects, we had mostly assets, uh, like portraits of characters and, and this kind of stuff. There was this core layer, the, more import the most important layer of the game, where uh, all the state and current progress of the game was. Uh, and this was like about three to 4,000 objects. Uh, and then there is the layer of, of presenting the game to the, to the player. And um, why I'm showing this? Because there was too much objects to interpret them and put them into the, into the safe. Uh, so I decided to make a system that will be serial, serializing directly all the objects that are in the, in the core layer. Serializing, putting in them into JSON, then to, into the file, and uh, to load the game, deserialize, and do the same process, but inverse. And this presented our some problems with the save load system. It was continuous. Uh, why? Because uh, or several reasons. Uh, but one thing, as I told you before. Uh, the system, the design was in constant uh, rework. We iterated all the systems. So the structure of the game uh, also changed. So if you had a save from like one month earlier or even one week earlier, uh, after uh, some iteration of other system, the save was, uh, wasn't compatible uh, with the current game. So that caused the problem with uh, testing uh, the further stages of the game. The balance, uh, it was hard to just play through the whole scenario till the end without the save load system uh, working properly. Uh, finally, we, 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 we have a system of uh, save compatibility, but we made it just at the end. 
because it was it would be uh, too expensive to to have it earlier to to develop it and uh, and support it through all the production process it would be just too expensive for us uh, the part solution to that was presenting the debug the console tools uh, for designers QA just to skip the the progress of the game to the further stages uh, and it, somehow it did work all right uh, about the content creation pipelines we used three things uh, scriptable objects and spreadsheets as as I told you before to create the content and also we use Playmaker uh, to uh, to implement the scenario you have the uh, I think it's the first stage of the second scenario here on the right uh, there is like the green blocks are the dialogues the red ones are the creating and checking the objectives uh, what was problem with all of these content creation pipelines uh, the first thing was the asset bindings like okay we had data in uh, in spreadsheets and we had to connect them somehow with uh, the assets that we that was referenced by the script table objects uh, and we had to bind them manually by typing the IDs there was no automatic system of, uh, of uh, content binding uh, and this was really error prone because somebody made a mistake writing some ID and there was already a bug in the uh, in the game uh, so this is a thing that we will do in our next project for sure just from the beginning we will think about it we didn't think about it in the beginning of the Whitcraft we didn't knew that it could be a problem uh, but now we know uh, also uh, there were some naming issues like you really have to think how you name your data like for example we had multiple strains in the game uh, and there were the ideas was like strain one strain two strain three and every strain had like up to five effects and the ideas of the effects was like effect one effect two effect three and then if you uh, debug the, the the structure of the game like pfft, what's here like in the game you have like grand daddy purple and have you have here you have like strain one like is this the same thing or not like you never know so really think uh, think about the naming uh, it's it's not so easy to have good naming convention and also we had uh, problems with localization because it was like an orphan feature uh, nobody really took care uh, until the very end about the localization okay there was some support of localization but like nobody really care about it okay there is we will take care about it later and finally uh, Kasper here uh, took it under his wings and I don't think he was really happy about it <laughs> yeah uh, there was some frustration uh, all right so yeah think about localization also it's more important than than you think okay in our game we introduced the 4k and I don't think this is this was the the best idea uh, why uh, because uh, there were really really a lot of issues with that the the biggest one uh, was the memory usage because in the game you had about 200 characters yeah 200 portraits uh, and every portrait was like big one there was like several types of portraits but there were big ones also and they had to be in 4k so they took a lot a lot of memory uh, we used finally we used some um, sprite packer with large uh, texture policy and it luckily it saved us enough memory for the game to work uh, under our specs uh, but yeah like if you don't really need 4k just think about do you really need if most of the players will play on 4k 
I'm not sure. If you're making the game on the consoles, yeah, maybe. But if you uh, make the game for uh, for PCs, uh, just think about it. And there were also some technical issues with Unity. Like, for example, uh, text component uh, downscaled to full HD from 4K uh, looked really bad. So then you had to use pixel perfect property in canvases. But then if we had pixel perfect and nested layouts, uh, nested layouts uh, in the UI, everything was trembling uh, because Unity couldn't calculate exactly the size. Luckily, we, we used TextMesh Pro finally, and uh, these issues uh, were solved. Uh, but yeah, Unity, I'm, it's not really well prepared for 4K. Uh, yeah. OK, there were also some unexpected events. Uh, this guy here is our QA lead. Uh, and, and this is his daughter. Uh, the, the time of, of delivery uh, was a few weeks. It was planned like a few weeks after the, the game release. Uh, but no. <laughs> Uh, she decided to come come out earlier, like I think one or two weeks before uh, before the release. So so he was out. So from our uh, three guys team uh, of QA, there were only two left, and without the lead. Uh, but luckily, they like they did a really enormous job uh, of keeping of keeping the the QA. Uh, intact and like they did the job, they did the job and yeah we were lucky uh, because if not the release would got uh, would went uh, worse than it did. Uh, the child is fine, he's healthy and and he was fired. No, it's not true. Okay, the release uh, here you, here you can see the. Our advanced counter of bugs that should have been already solved, but they aren't. Uh, what was the, our biggest uh, mistake um, during the release? All the builds that we did before, all the builds that we tested, all the builds that we sent to, uh, to test houses were 64 bits. And I don't know why. In the end, the first build that went to the Steam and was released was 32 bits. So f something that we didn't really test it before. And we, luckily, we re realized uh, just really fast, like in one or two hours, we realized there are some strange crashes for some people. And we didn't know why. And then we just checked, uh, OK, hmm, maybe it's not the best build. Uh, and we just built another one in 64 bits and, and uh, uploaded it to Steam. But really, you have to have uh, procedures uh, to avoid these kind of mistakes, especially if there is a lot, a lot of work and everybody is working over time and, uh, and can make uh, a mistake like that. Also, we had some negative reviews from Linux users uh, where the game wasn't working, but it was stated that this game doesn't support Linux, but nevertheless, they put a negative review. Okay. Uh, and some people tried to play on the game on really old laptops with integrated graphics that couldn't handle our game. Uh, some of these issues we, uh, we fixed, some we didn't. But and we had uh, about 20 high priority bugs after the release. So it's not that bad, really. We fixed them in a, just a few days after the release. And now it's, it's quite stable. There's not many crashes more <laughs> of the game. Uh, what are the solutions for these problems? We just have to test the game more. We have to make our QA team bigger, and I would like to uh, make some automatic testing in, the, in our next game. Uh, I hope it will work. 
Okay, and some marketing issues that we have, uh, that we had after the release. Uh, the game is about uh, wheat, about marijuana, and Facebook and YouTube decided that they won't support us. Uh, like Facebook, it's not a big deal, but the videos uh, of the game on YouTube, uh, they were uh, demonetized. Yeah, so a YouTuber couldn't uh, earn money on advertisements uh, putting a video of a let's play of our game. Uh, so uh, this is quite big marketing hit for us. Uh, there were some articles about it. Like here, there's a uh, header from from Vice, uh, but clearly, the, like articles in internet are not as powerful as as YouTubers. Uh, so yeah, this was a problem. But what could we do? It's a bit of hypocrisy because you can have a video about the game about killing people, like I don't know, uh, breaking spines or like blood everywhere or something, but you cannot have a, like a serious game about cannabis industry. Like, what could we do? Nothing. Uh, oh, so we had some issues uh, concerning our um, medical group portraits. Uh, because there is a medical marijuana feature in our game and we had to represent medical groups somehow, so we, we draw the portraits of, of sick people. And uh, the guy here uh, is from, from Game Reactor, I guess, I'm not sure, I don't remember, or GameSpot. Uh, and there were some also other reviews. Uh, he felt offended uh, by our uh, visualization of, of sick people. Uh, but at the same time, in the same article, he writes that uh, our game doesn't uh, in, uh, doesn't address the real life impact of it. But here is the like medical marijuana. It's not a real life impact of the of it. I don't know. It's quite strange. But okay, uh, he did like the game. He did like the mechanics. Uh, but still, like five out of ten because just because of the portraits. Uh, so I'm not sure if this solution worked, but at least we were listening what people are saying and we tried to address the issue. Uh, so yeah, we, we changed the, uh, the medical portraits to be less controversial. I don't know. Mm. All right. What are the conclu conclusions uh, after these two and a half years of, uh, of production? Uh, we managed to deliver the game in a genre that was new for us, uh, of the size that was new for us. It was, I think, like 10 times bigger than all the games that we made before. And we, we did deliver it. And it's, I have to say it's a quality game. Uh, so we are proud. Uh, from this achievement. Uh, and also, we learned that the solutions that we, uh, that we had in our uh, previous smaller games doesn't necessarily apply to bigger projects like Witchcraft. Like for example, not hiring a producer. We will hire a producer to our next game. Uh, all the experience that we gain in the genre, in the sim tycoon genre, uh, uh, will be transferred to our new game, which will be also a sim tycoon game. Uh, what else? Our team is now more specialized and experienced uh, in this genre, so uh, that's why we decided to make the game that's not similar, but in the, in the same genre. Mm, and we will focus more on pipelines uh, to ease the uh, the production to make it quicker and less error prone. All right, that's it. Uh, if you want to contact us, 
this, these are some males. Uh, we, we will be hiring people, talented ones. Uh, so if you're interested, just, just give us a, a note or talk to us directly. Uh, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Mr. Potato. I don't know, he's in the game. I don't know how, how, how he made to the game, but he's there. You can meet no, him. No <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> you can meet him if you want. I, I'm sure he has some interesting tales to say. Uh, all right. Thank you very much.